Good morning, everyone. It is eight o'clock and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I am happy to see you all. Uh, just an update. We are working on getting us all back together in person for Grand Rounds. Uh, if not, uh, my, I anticipate it'll be uh, for the first Grand Rounds of March, but stay tuned. If, if that ends up being sooner, we'll certainly communicate that out to everyone. Uh, beyond that, um, RN11 is both presenting and, uh, and moderating, so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, do an introduction for her. Uh, RN11 came to us by way of, uh, of Cornell. Uh, she's been an extraordinary resident with her hands in many things. Uh, she's been very productive in, uh, both in education realm and in her research as well. Uh, something you don't know about Ariana is uh, for someone who didn't grow up here or hasn't lived here for over five years, she has the most comprehensive listing and descriptions of things to do within various distances uh, from Moran. That could be three hours, five hours, eight hours. If you have any uh, planned road trips, I highly suggest you connect with her. Uh, and somehow she's managed to, to know our state better than a lot of people have lived here uh, our whole lives. Without further ado, Ariane, I'll turn the time over to you and let you take it. Thanks, Dr. Petty. I had not prepared such extravagant introductions for me or Marshall, but I guess I got to give Marshall one now too, so I can wing it. Uh, as Dr. Petty said, um, Ariane Levin, I'm here with Marshall Huang. We're both PGY4 residents. Uh, Marshall Huang, like uh, me, came to Moran from first Connecticut and then Cornell, and we are both applying to glaucoma. Um, Marshall, let's see, uh, Marshall also has traveled the state of Utah. He got me uh, my first ski setup from Costco and has since uh, shown me the mountains. So uh, next year, I'll be at WashU St. Louis for Glaucoma Fellowship, and Marshall will be at Minnesota Eye Consultants for Glaucoma Fellowship. And today we're going to take you through some glaucoma. We'll start in the 1960s with an overview of steroid-induced ocular hypertension and glaucoma, um, where we've come from, where we are now. And we'll move forward to uh, present day with a review of uh, MIGS outcomes. Let me share my screen. Okay. So starting with an overview of steroid-induced glaucoma, our consult resident was called recently for a consult on blurry vision, headache, and halos. Uh, let me just change this. And this was in a pediatric patient with a diagnosis of ALL who had started chemotherapy and IV dexamethasone eight days prior to the consult. On exam, the patient was 20-20 in each eye with an intraocular pressure over 60 in each eye. And the exam was otherwise normal with deep angles, no cupping of the optic nerve. The patient was started on maximum IOP lowering therapy and at follow-up the next day, the pressure was 45 in the right eye and 35 in the left eye. Two days later, the pressure had come back up above 50 in each eye and the patient went to the operating room for IOP lowering surgery. Glaucoma history overall is really recent. For example, the ocular hypertension treatment study, OATS, uh, which determined that lowering intraocular pressure reduces the risk of glaucoma, came out in 2002, which is probably within the lifetime of everyone in this room. I think that's one of the exciting things about glaucoma. And also recent in the 1950s and 1960s, Dr. Armely uh, was doing a lot of the early work at University of Iowa. One of his earliest projects, the Des Moines Population Study of Glaucoma, measured characteristics of eyes in the population and described crucial basics like normal ranges of intraocular pressure. This was followed by his collaborative glaucoma study, which defined the cup to disc ratio um, that we use now. And his early work also included steroid induced ocular hypertension and glaucoma. So shown here is one of his important early studies titled Effect of Corticosteroids on Intraocular Pressure and Fluid Dynamics, the Effect of Dexamethasone in the Glaucomatous Eye. This was a prospective study with 19 eyes with primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, pressures ranged from 25 to 30, and also 15 eyes with normotensive glaucoma um, with pressures ranging from 13 to 20. 
the eyes were to be treated with steroid. Now, one of the interesting points about the study design is that he already knew that steroid could cause huge increases in pressure, like the case we started with today. So in fact, in this study, he set an upper limit uh, of the baseline intraocular pressure in his inclusion criteria so that he would not induce huge spikes uh, in treating the eyes in the study um, with steroid. In this study, antihypertensive were stopped in the right eye with the left eye as a control and topical dexamethasone, 0.1% uh, three times a day was applied to the right eye. The graph that we're looking at here shows one example eye from the study. Intraocular pressure is on the y-axis and on the x-axis, there's a dark bar indicating when dexamethasone was started and then stopped. The intraocular pressure in the right eye is shown on the dotted line, and we see a big spike in the baseline pressure from about 26 up to 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this coincides with dexamethasone uh, application, and then that spike resolves when the dex is discontinued. The left eye is the solid line, the control eye uh, below, and um, we see that there's not much change there. And then on the right side of the graph, the eyes are treated with pilocarpine in addition to dexamethasone. And we still see a spike with the dexamethasone, uh, but the pilocarpine dampens this spike. This study additionally showed that steroids reduced outflow facility in these eyes and that primary open angle glaucoma and normotensive glaucoma um, were both of eyes with both of these were both affected by the dexamethasone. Now the incidence of steroid induced elevations in intraocular pressure varies in studies and studies on this topic are heterogeneous because we use steroids in so many different clinical scenarios. We use it after surgery, for hyphema, for uveitis, um, but overall review papers state that the incidence might be as high as 40%. We're looking at a few clinical examples here. So first we have a paper that uh, measured intraocular pressure after pterygium surgery. This paper was prospective with 62 patients who were on a long dexamethasone uh, taper for three months. Six of the patients, which was just under 10%, had an intraocular pressure rise greater than 10 millimeters of mercury above their baseline and 45% had a peak intraocular pressure occurring one month after surgery. The second paper shown here looked at eyes uh, following DSEC. It was retrospective with 81 eyes. The eyes got subconjunctival dexamethasone, uh, then also one dose of acetazolamide, 500, immediately after surgery, and then we're on a dexamethasone drop taper for three months. In this group, almost 20% of eyes developed a high intraocular pressure, which was defined as greater than 21 millimeters of mercury or six above baseline. Those are common uh, measurements that are used in papers. And these eyes uh, had the IOP spike resolve after steroids were withdrawn. The time to steroid-induced ocular hypertension in this paper ranged from one week to 16 months. The third paper shown here uh, looked at intravitreal triamcinolone for vein occlusion. This was uh, a randomized controlled trial. It was not randomized for steroids. It was randomized for other treatment for vein occlusion, uh, but they did assess the effect of the steroid on intraocular pressure in the randomized controlled trial. The incidence of a pressure greater than 10 above baseline at 36 months, so at three years, was just 2% in the control group 9% with one milligram dose of uh, intravitreal triamcinolone and 45% with the four milligram dose. And this paper established that there was a dose dependent relationship. In studies of intraocular pressure and glaucoma in eyes receiving injections for retinal pathology, it can be really tough to tease out what the uh, effect of the intraocular what the effect of steroid on intraocular pressure is versus the effect of the injections themselves, because there is good information in published studies to suggest that intravitreal injections themselves can elevate intraocular pressure chronically in some eyes, even without steroid. And also to compare these versus the effects of the underlying retinal pathology, like neovascularization on the pressure. 
this study here, the long-term incidence and timing of intraocular hypertension after intravitreal triamcinolone injection is a retrospective study of 929 eyes that received at least one pars plana injection of triamcinolone and the mean number of injections was 1.6. Uh, in the graph on the y-axis, uh, we're looking at the need for um, uh, the need for IOP lowering medications, and so all the way at the top, the, where it says 1.0, that would be 100% um, of eyes. And then the x-axis is the time in months after the first triamcinolone injection. Eyes with a history of glaucoma are indicated with the di the dotted line and then eyes without glaucoma are the solid line. And in this study, 13% of eyes overall needed IOP lowering medications six months after injection. Also 24%, which is a quarter of the eyes needed IOP lowering medication at two years and three eyes required IOP lowering surgery. And we see that eyes with a history of glaucoma are at higher risk. And that's true throughout studies of uh, steroid-induced ocular hypertension and glaucoma. As I said, though, it can be tough in these studies to tease out what is the effect of the steroid versus underlying pathology related to injection or retinal pathology um, or the natural course of glaucoma in the glaucomatous eyes. So what we really need in this kind of study is a control group uh, without steroids. Now, what about the difference between uh, routes of administration or uh, doses or types of steroids? In the OR these days, for example, some of our surgeons have replaced topical prednisolone with subconjunctival injection immediately post-op um, or with Dextenza, which is shown in the bottom, an intracanalicular steroid implant. Does the steroid dosage or the proximity to the outflow system make a difference in the effect on IOP? There are some studies that have compared steroid strengths and roots. I don't have uh, data on Dextenza for you today, but the chart that we're looking at here is from a prospective study of 155 eyes newly diagnosed with uveitis. They could receive steroids by any route, and eyes with glaucoma already on IOP lowering treatment were excluded from this study. Uh, in this study, a steroid-induced IOP elevation was reported in 8%. That's in the first highlighted uh, line there. 8% of the eyes on topical steroids and 37% of the eyes treated with oral steroids. To our point earlier, the authors in this study uh, do distinguish between steroid-induced intraocular pressure rise um, separate from IOP rise that's likely due to other causes like synechiae. And then it's also important in this study to recognize that there might be inherent differences in the eyes that are treated with topical versus oral steroids that would predispose them to a high IOP. For example, the eyes treated with oral steroids uh, might be sicker at baseline. This chart is from a review paper and summarizes the published effects of different topical preparations. Um, in red, I've circled dexamethasone, prednisolone, um, FML, the uh, topicals that we often use here. And the range in intraocular pressure increases is shown in the second column. The highest rises are shown with dexamethasone and the lowest with FML, but there's quite a bit of a range. And this possibly is demonstrating that IOP elevations are more severe in some eyes compared with others, even with the same drug. And we'll talk in a moment about uh, steroid responders versus non-responders. On the right, the proportion of patients in each group in which IOP rises also ranges quite a bit. So for example, with FML, published studies uh, show that IOP is elevated in a range from 0% of patients to 88% of patients. Moving on to pathophysiology and what's going on in the eye uh, when treated with steroids, recall that in the conventional outflow pathway, the aqueous drains from the anterior chamber through the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal. Steroids have been shown to decrease outflow and to increase intraocular pressure via trabecular meshwork remodeling. The effect of steroid on the trabecular meshwork 
uh, has been shown well in cultured eyes. So in the study that we're looking at here, anterior segments from donor eyes were mounted, that's shown in the illustration on the upper left, and exposed to dexamethasone in culture. Uh, and then the eyes were examined under an electron microscope for changes in the TM. The graph on the right is showing intraocular pressure on the y-axis uh, and uh, days on the x-axis. Some eyes were determined to be steroid responders, and these were analyzed separately from eyes that were determined not to be. The white bars are the control eyes without dexamethasone exposure, and the intraocular pressure does not change from zero to 12 eyes, uh, 12 days in these control eyes. The gray bars were the eyes treated with dexamethasone, and we see a large increase in the intraocular pressure in the subset of eyes that was determined to be steroid responders. Uh, the gray bars on the right where we don't see a change are the non-responders. Under the electron microscope, the DEX responders had increased density of trabecular meshwork structures, loss of TM cells, increased TM extracellular material, and decreased outflow facility. Several papers have shown changes specifically in the cytoskeleton of trabecular meshwork exposed to steroid. So we're looking at a representative image here from a paper that's titled Dexamethasone Alters F-Actin Architecture and Promotes Cross-Linked Actin Network Formation in Human TM uh, Tissue. And the circled structures are cross-linked actin networks in steroid-exposed eyes. Um, finally, I'll make a quick comment on a few of the protein signaling pathways that have been studied. Many genes have been examined for possible roles in steroid-induced ocular hypertension, and these are just a few of them. So the myosillin and TIGR gene is really interesting because it was first reported, it was the first reported disease-causing mutation in primary open angle glaucoma um, in a publication in 1997. And coincidentally, uh, it was also identified as a trabecular meshwork inducible glucocorticoid response protein in cell culture the same year. And so the protein was shown uh, to be induced by the glucocorticoid signaling pathway. Um, however, there's still no known causal link between uh, myosillin and specifically steroid induced ocular hypertension or glaucoma. Alkaline phosphatase has been shown to be elevated, and matrix G1A protein has been shown to be low in eyes with a steroid response. And there's a hypothesis that these uh, markers of calcification are indicating stiffness in the tissues. Similarly, the TGF beta and Wnt signaling pathways have been studied uh, also as uh, indication of tissue stiffness and fibrosis, uh, leading to increased intraocular pressure with. Um, steroid signaling. And then IL-1 has also been looked at uh, as having inflammatory effects that may decrease outflow in these eyes. So in conclusion, steroid-induced ocular hypertension can occur in up to 40% of patients and can occur as early as one week. Um, now, one week is a typical time point for us to see a patient, and so it may be that the steroid response is occurring earlier and we're not catching it before one week. There are steroid responders and non-responders. Um, increased density of, cells, of cytoskeletal components of the trabecular meshwork have been well described, and the underlying genetics is not completely elucidated, but many signaling pathways have been hypothesized to play a role. Thank you. Um, we have time to take some questions now, otherwise I'll turn it over to Marshall. Um, so I'm looking at a question in the chat, are children more likely to get steroid response? Uh, that's an interesting question because I think that in the early studies, like Dr. Armley's studies, older age looked like it was uh, a risk factor, but in more of the recent studies, younger age is identified as a risk factor. I think that these studies are looking at uh, younger adults. So I'm not sure uh, how children compare to adults. 
just a reminder for anyone that wants to be unmuted, just go ahead and raise your hand. We can unmute you, or you can ask uh, questions in the chat. Uh, that, that's an impressive, uh, impressive uh, review and amount of information. Looks like uh, Craig Chai is asking, Kaiser show, or rather stating, Kaiser showed a subconch catalog after cataract surgery that increased risk for ocular hypertension the closer to the limbus it was injected. Thanks, Dr. Chai, for that comment. And I think that's also something for us to think about as we consider uh, even what to use after cataract surgery, whether you're doing topicals or subconj injection or uh, intracanalicular, um, these have different proximity to the drainage system. Um, at the same time, different ability to get them out of the eye if needed. Uh, and I think we just don't have um, great data for everything. And some of what we talked about today the complexity, the comorbidities with retinal pathology, all of these things can make uh, the effects kind of hard to study. But I do think the proximity, as Dr. Chaya said, is something important to think about as we treat our patients. And uh, about is Dr. Mamelis. Why don't you go ahead and make your comment and then we'll uh, you know, read Dr. Chorkoff's question next. Or Kariana, that's, that's a great review of a very complex topic. And I think we understand the reason why the steroid affects the trabecular mesh group and why we get um, the steroid responders. But the bottom line is, in spite of all we've looked at in the genetics and everything, we still don't know who's a responder and who's not a responder until we actually try it. And that's what's going to be critical in this topic is if we know ahead of time who's a responder, who should we avoid the steroids on? Because the scary part of this is, again, I've seen people have a response in a week. And so it, it's, it's a very difficult you know, very difficult to issue not knowing who that responder is going to be and who that responder is not going to be. And so I think that's that's where the money is going to be in doing this kind of research is to see how we can predict the responders ahead of time before we get into trouble. And by the way, before I go on, you've been in Utah now for, for two and a half years and you've already learned, learned to drop your T and you say mountain now. So we've made you a Utah. That, that's, that's very good. Thank you, Dr. Malis. That's a big compliment. Uh, <laughs> that was not a compliment, by the way. So that's, that's oh. <laughs> um, And then we have a few comments from uh, Dr. Chaya, Dr. Simpson, talking about the distal outflow system that eyes that uh, have goniotomy can still get a steroid response. Um, and I think that's important as well. Something I didn't touch on um, today, but I don't know completely what the literature on it is, but I do know that here at Moran, there's been some discussion again about which pathways could be affecting that distal outflow system. Even for example, could RAS pathway um, play a role or uh, also when we're using these drops and seeing uh, like the eyes get so red and seeing dilation of um, vessels, what kind of, um, constriction and dilation throughout the system uh, is having an effect here. So the short answer is, I don't know the specifics, but it's really important also to think about the outflow system distally. And Ariana, one more question from Susan Shortkoff. What did you find out about other routes of administration, inhaled injections uh, or other areas? Also a good question. Uh, I did not, uh, I'm not sure. I think that the steroids in all forms maybe have the same effect, but I can't speak to the literature on it. And then a, a clinical question, you know, one that we come across, across a lot in our uh, post-call patients who've been put on steroids, they may have other reasons, kind of this multifactorial glaucoma. Do you have any tips for teasing out um, the steroid response among things such as trauma or, or other, you know, factors that could be contributing. Um, we often cite the timeline of the, of the pressure rise, but uh, any pearls for teasing that out and whether or not we need to adjust our steroid treatments? Yeah, I'm sure I'm not the best person in the room to give clinical pearls, but I had two patients recently with hyphemas who, I, who had very high pressure and I thought it was steroid response or maybe I just wanted it to be uh, and it was more likely from all the cell and hyphema and inflammation in their eyes. And I think that um, it maybe makes sense to withdraw steroid as quickly or switch to a, a less 
um, offensive dose or uh, drug as best as you can. And if the pressure is not coming down, maybe it's something else at the same time, like the case we started with, um, at the, with a really high pressure, I think it doesn't necessarily come down so immediately as the steroids are withdrawn. And so could be a combination of things as well. Final comment from Marissa La Rochelle. We find Duracell to be extremely hypertensive in kids. Thanks everyone for your input. Uh, I will pass it over to Marcel. All right. So thanks, Ariana, for the excellent presentation. Um, we um, will go ahead and continue with our glaucoma grand rounds. Um, again, my name is Marshall Hong. I'm a PGY4 here at the Moran, and I'll be presenting on long-term MIGS outcomes. And Marshall, uh, no do disclosures. Want your videos to show a and we'll start year. with glaucoma. So why do we care? Well, globally, it is one of the most common causes of blindness. Um, it causes 2.1 million, oh, hold on. My view. Okay. Um, so it causes um, 2.1 million uh, cases of blindness worldwide, about 6.6% of blindness um, total. And that's a 62% increase from 1990. Um, it also causes 4.2 million cases of moderate or severe vision impairment, uh, defined as worse than 2060 vision. And that's actually an 83% increase from 1990. Um, overall, there are about 65 million people um, that have glaucoma of any stage, and that's globally. And the United States um, also kind of mixed in with high income North America, so Canada, um, we find that about 50,000 people are blind from glaucoma. Um, that's a 20% increase. And then about double that with uh, moderate to severe vision impairment, also an increase from 1990. Um, the caseload is about 2.7 million um, in the United States overall. And about half of those cases are estimated to be undiagnosed. So definitely a, a problem with a large burden for our, um, our society. Um, in terms of glaucoma, all it is is a pressure-related damage to the optic nerve. There are more complex definitions, but I think that generally covers it. And decreasing the pressure has been shown to decrease progression in numerous studies. And that makes it easy for us as glaucoma surgeons, um, because basically all of, our, um, all of our treatments work to do that one thing, decrease the pressure. Um, just as a brief overview, um, this is a chart that separates the surgical glaucoma options um, into their mechanisms of action, as well as their uh, surgical approach. So starting on the left here, we have subconjunctival drainages. Um, and for the ab external uh, versions, that's basically our traditional glaucoma surgeries, so trabeculectomies and tube shunts. Um, they now do have an ab interno version, the Zen gel stent, um, but as um, many people found the outcomes can often be better if it's implanted ab externally. And also there's a, a pressure flow, which is similar, that um, will be designed to be implanted ab externally. Um, in terms of the trabecular drainage, we will be mostly focusing on the ab internal versions of that. Um, you can do an ab external version of a, a canalostomy and canaloplasty, um, but those are less common, especially for our um, adult open angle glaucomas. Um, for our ab internal trabecular drainage devices, that includes most of our mix. So that includes the eye stents, um, hydrus, um, and then all the goniotomies. So trabectome, hook, dual blade, GAT, omni, um, as well as um, ab internal canaloplasty. So that's the eye track and the omni. Um, for the suprachoroidal drainage systems, uh, we do not have any in America that are currently available. Um, the mini jet was recently approved in Europe in 2019, I believe, uh, to be implanted. And iSense Supra was, um, had a CE mark in Europe, but is not um, being used clinically per se. The SciPass, as you might know, um, was previously available, but has now been, um, um, has been recalled. Um, in terms of the inflow modifying procedures, we have ab external um, CPC as well as internal ECP. Um, I will not be focusing on those, um, those uh, techniques for the sake of time. 
So we'll first start with the definition of MIGS. Um, this was coined by uh, Dr. Ahmed um, in 2009 initially, and it's either minimally or microinvasive glaucoma surgery. And it's um, the first, uh, the first um, my kind of qualification is that it's an ab internal micro incisional approach. Um, that has been changed a little bit over time, especially with the Zen gel stent and the Preser flow coming out, where um, they may be starting to allow an ab external approach uh, for some mix uh, procedures, depending on how you define it. Um, generally, it's minimally traumatic um, and being mostly ab internal, it generally preserves conch. Um, there is a IOP lowering efficacy to warrant the procedure itself. There should be a high safety profile because these are used mostly for mild and moderate cases of glaucoma. And there should be a rapid recovery, basically similar to the recovery um, that you'd expect from cataract surgery. So going back to this chart, um, again, we will focus here on the trabecular drainage devices, um, the ab internal trabecular drainage devices in this talk, um, as those are the ones that are available in the US. Um, so we'll start with the eye stent. Um, the eye stent uh, was first developed back in 1999. It was first uh, implanted in a human in 2001. Um, it was the first trabecular micro bypass stent that um, was implanted in a human. Um, it was finally approved in 2012 with the first generation eye stent um, that's often described as a snorkel. You can see it's an L-shaped um, device that is open on one end um, on the, that will be on the uh, posterior aspect of Shum's canal, and has retention arches in order to keep it in place. Um, in 2018, they updated it to the eye stent inject, so that's the second generation. Um, they made it a bit easier to implant, you just go straight into the trabecular meshwork, um, and they uh, basically found that there's not a, it's easier because there's not a right side and a left side associated with it. Um, then the following year, they um, update that again to the eye stent inject W. And you can see they're basically the same thing. Um, the only difference is really the wider flange, which is what the W stands for. Um, that's to help hold it in place and prevent it from going too far into the trabecular meshwork. Um, most of our studies um, that I'm gonna be citing are gonna be talking about the G1 and the G2 eye stent. So in terms of ISEN outcomes, I'll start with the randomized control trials that we have available, um, so particularly the ones that have over two year follow up, because that's what we'll be focusing on, just the long term outcomes. Um, so Samuelson uh, presented a paper in 2019 that compared 387 FACO eye stents, two eye stents versus FACO alone, um, and had a 24 month follow up. Um, they did do a washout and found that the unmedicated IOP reduction was about seven. Um, for the FACO eye stent group um, compared to five and a half for the FACO alone group. Um, they also noticed a, um, a medication reduction of 1.2 drops uh, for the FACO eye stent group versus 0.8 for the control group. And overall, they found that 76% of patients um, had an unmedicated IOP reduction greater than 20%, which they considered um, a success. And here's just a few charts from the paper that summarizes that. Um, and this is another um, RCT that basically compared eye stents with, it, um, with itself. So they used first generation eye stents, um, comparing one eye stent to two eye stents to three eye stents. Um, and they had up to 42 months of follow up. Um, overall, they found that the unmedicated, again with a washout, um, IOP reduction was 7.6 for one eye stent, 9.2 for two, and 10.9 for three. Um, and the unmed, uh, and the medic, unmedicated IOP reduction um, was greater than 20% and 61% of people with the first generation eye stent, um, but 91% of patients for both, the, uh, for both two and three eye stents implanted. Um, and you can see here that, um, especially here, the survival curve um, in terms of percentage of people taking no medications, you can see that um, the curve is essentially identical for the two and the three eye stents, um, but significantly lower for the one eye stent, suggesting that um, two eye stents might be the sweet spot in terms of uh, long-term pressure control with the eye stent. Um, here are a couple other uh, randomized controlled trials. I don't want to focus on them too much because they're not as good quality as the previous ones uh, and also with smaller sample sizes, but just briefly, a uh, VOLD here compared eye, two eye stents to just uh, Travacross alone, um, basically showing a similar IOP reduction um, an unmedicated IOP reduction between the two. 
Um, and the FEA um, did a smaller study here um, comparing a single eye stent with, uh, with uh, FACO, um, also showing that the eye stent uh, was more effective at maintaining um, the pre-off washed out IOP, whereas in the FACO only group, it rose above the, the pre-op baseline IOP. They also showed that the FACO eye stent group did have a decrease um, in uh, eye drops compared to the control also. Um, so here are a couple more studies that are longer term follow-ups, um, but not randomized controlled studies. Um, so here it was a prospective study um, with a planned five-year follow-up comparing FACO eye stent, um, the second generation, and that's just one eye stent compared to one eye stent alone, so without FACO. Um, overall, they saw a medication reduction of about nine, mil, uh, about nine uh, millimeters of mercury versus about 11 millimeters of mercury. Um, so just slightly more with the ice that alone group. They also noted a drop reduction of 1.7 versus 2.2. Um, overall, they defined success um, as uh, IOP less than 15 millimeters of mercury, which they found in 86% of people in the combined group versus 71% um, in the in the uh, eye stent alone group. And you can see here preoperatively only 2% and 1% met those um, qualifications. And here they have, um, like I said, five years of follow-up data. And you can see that the mean pressure remains fairly consistent um, from years uh, two to four. Um, and again, this is showing the, uh, the uh, percentage of uh, uh, the, the amount of reduction rather. Um, showing a 39% reduction in the uh, combined group and a 42% reduction in the standalone group. Um, there's another study to kind of uh, corroborate that. Um, this is a, um, a eye stent uh, first generation versus an eye stent second generation, basically showing that they're pretty comparable. So we don't have to worry that there's a decrease in efficacy um, with the second generation eye stent. And here, um, these are some retrospective trials, um, again, looking at longer term follow up. Um, here, there are 35 patients at five years um, showing a decrease in IOP from a baseline of about 18 and a half um, to a, a five year post of a 14 and a half. And 62% of people had greater than 20% IOP reduction in that study. And this study is showing a uh, follow-up up to eight years. And again, the pressure remains fairly consistent, dropping from 19 to 14 and staying at around 14 or so for the duration of the study up to eight years. So overall, um, we can expect a mean ILP reduction of five to 10 millimeters of mercury on average um, of their washed out ILPs, um, whether that's implanted with a standalone device or when combined with cataract surgery. Um, when you compare it just to cataract surgery, um, the difference may be as low as one and a half millimeters of mercury, but still a significant difference statistically. Um, on average, we see a mean drop of about a half a uh, eye drop per patient. Um, and the studies suggest that the effects are likely to persist for five or even eight years at least. Um, and then I present a study showing that two eye stents um, seem definitely better than one, but three eye stents are not convincingly better. Um, and with all these studies, there are virtually no significant adverse events. Um, the next one I'll be talking about is the Hydrus. Um, so that is by Ivantis and approved in 2019. Um, it's an eight millimeter uh, crescent shaped device that covers about 90 uh, degrees of Schlem's canal. Um, and I think I do have a hand raise, uh, Dr. Jacoby. Okay, we'll, we'll go back if there's no question. Um, so here, um, again, uh, another study by Samuelson in 2019, very similar um, uh, uh, device, uh, excuse me, study design as this other study with the, with the eye stents. Um, here she's comparing 369 FACO hydrous eyes to 187 FACOs, uh, FACO only eyes. Um, and again, he does a, a 24 month follow-up. Um, they see a, 7.6 um, point decrease in the combined group compared to a 4.2 uh, point decrease in the uh, 
FACO group. Um, a significant difference, but also a significant uh, decrease in both, uh, in both uh, groups. For uh, the drop reduction, uh, similar to the ice stent, we see about 1.4 um, drops on average reduced for the FACO hydrous com combination versus uh, one drop um, less for the FACO alone. Um, and we also see 77% versus about 60% um, for IOP reduction um, for the FACO hydrous versus the FACO alone. And here you see good stability um, from the one month mark up until the two year mark, suggesting that it's stable at least the two years based on this study. Um, so in terms of RCTs that over the two year follow up, um, Pfeiffer et al. did one in 2015 with a slightly smaller sample size, but also showed a, um, a greater decrease um, in the FACO hydro size compared to the FACO only eyes. Um, and also a, um, um, the difference was about you know, one to two millimeters of mercury as seen previously. Um, IOP reduction success was similar, 80% um, um, versus 46% um, for decrease of over 20%. Um, just recently um, at AAO, um, an abstract was presented by Dr. Ike Ahmed looking at the five-year horizon data um, for the FACO hydrus versus the FACO trial. Um, this is not published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal, but this is uh, at least from his slide that he's presented. Um, they found that 66% versus 46% um, were medication-free at the end of five years. And one of the bigger findings was that um, far less of the FACO hydrous group required glaucoma surgery after five years. In fact, it was 2.8 times less likely to require um, successive glaucoma surgery um, after having the highest eye stent. Um, they also presented that um, the endothelial cell counts were stable at five years for, uh, uh, for both of these groups. Um, there was one uh, randomized controlled trial directly comparing iSent with Hydrus. Um, unlike some of the other randomized controlled trials presented, this was not um, a completely washed out comparison. Um, so they had a medicated IOP reduction that they um, showed was uh, one millimeter mercury versus 1.7. Um, they also showed a drop reduction of one versus 1.6 um, and a greater than 20% uh, decrease in IOP from the washed out baseline medications of 13.3 versus 40% or so. Um, overall, it's showing a relatively small difference in the IOP reduction. But if you look at the, uh, the change in the medication amount, that is a more significant difference. Um, so the, uh, ice stent, uh, uh, the ice stent times two group uh, require significantly more medications to maintain their IRP goal compared to the hydrus, suggesting that the hydrus was a little bit more effective at maintaining the pressure. So overall, um, I conclude that the mean IOP reduction uh, from the hydrus is similar to ice stent, um, expecting maybe five to 10 millimeters of mercury um, if you're looking at a washed out IOP decrease. Um, and the IOP reduction, if you're comparing this just standard FACO, may be as low as two millimeters of mercury. Um, the drop reduction is a little bit increased, um, around one drop on average per person. And again, we expect the, uh, the effect lasts for at least five years. We do not have any data beyond five years, so can't claim that it lasts as long as I stent. Um, and overall, there were, there's a theoretical um, benefit of the eye stents being safer, being that it's a, a smaller device. But based on the studies, um, both had very little adverse events, and it's hard to really claim that one is safer than the other. Um, so the next group of, uh, of procedure I want to talk about is removal of trabecular meshwork. Um, and there are a few terms that I want to just clarify because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, with uh, goniotomy, you expect just based on uh, how it's written that it's, uh, it's defined as an opening of the TM. Goniectomy, you might expect as excision of the trabecular meshwork. Trabeculotomy, again, opening, and trabeculectomy, an excision of the TM. Um, but it's not really clear how uh, these are categorized just based on uh, their names. Um, so um, overall, goniotomy um, is the most preferred, uh, preferred word for uh, the device for the MIGS devices that remove trabecular meshwork, um, particularly if they're an ab interno technique. Um, those are all coded by the same CPT code. Um, so whether that's 
Rectome, KDB, GAT, Omni, iTrack, um, all of those, if uh, approached from an ab internal technique to remove the trabecular meshwork are all gonna be coded the same and all would be termed a goniotomy. Um, certainly you could call say like a, a trabectona a goniectomy, um, but it's rarely used and a goniotomy is more preferred. Um, another option would be the ab interno trabeculectomy or an ab interno trabeculotomy. Um, there is a theoretical distinction between the trabectome and KDB because they actually excise tissue versus um, something like a GAT, which just uh, opens the tissue. Um, but again, the CPT code is the same and there's not necessarily a clear difference um, in the outcomes clinically. Uh, in terms of trabeculotomy, um, it's generally defined as an ab external technique um, and it's often used for congenital glaucoma, especially when there's a pacified cornea. So we can't do an ab, -terno, ab internal technique. Uh, and then trabeculectomy um, is our traditional trab that we think of. Though um, in reality, we don't necessarily need to excise the TM and maybe a more accurate term would be a gardus sclerocaratectomy just because of how uh, the flap is made. So now that we've gone through some of the definitions there, um, I'll start with the trabectome. Uh, originally it was created by Neomedics um, and uh, then was bought by MST. Um, it was originally uh, released in 2006. And what it involves is a, a electrocautery tip um, with a foot plate that prevents um, any disruption of tissue posterior to the foot plate. Um, and there is a, uh, there, there is a device um, that it connects to, and then there's a disposable handpiece uh, that you use for it. Um, so not too many randomized controlled trials available for the trabectome, but here is uh, one of the few. Um, this is comparing phaco trabectome with phaco trabeculectomy, um, and there's just a 12-month follow-up. Overall, they do show that the trabeculectomy is more effective, as, as, as you might expect, um, with uh, six millimeters of mercury decrease versus 3.2. Um, there's also a significantly, um, no, excuse me, there is, however, a less of a drop reduction uh, with the trabeculectomy group compared to the trabectome group. Um, overall, um, in terms of medication-free IOP reduction greater than 20%, um, you have 20% of the trabectome group versus 50% of the um, trabeculectomy group. Um, in, in terms of the non-randomized uh, controlled trials, we do have a few with some larger sample sizes. Um, here, um, one by USIV in 2020, um, they looked at 39 phaco trabectones versus 39 phaco eye stents, uh, one of the generation two eye, eye stents. Um, they show that there's a significant IOP reduction in the phaco trabectome group, but really not much at all in the phaco eye stent group. Um, and again, a greater drop reduction in the trabectome group compared to the eye stent group. Um, and then this next study is a 90-month uh, retrospective study um, where they show, they seem to show a really good sustained effect uh, of IOP reduction from the trabectome um, from, from 23, from 23 to 16. I mean, a drop reduction of two to six. However, uh, if you look at the numbers here, the number of patients that make it past um, even 72 months is pretty minimal compared to the original sample size. Um, so definitely um, at risk for some bias errors with this study. Um, and moving forward to the Kahook dual blade, um, this was first developed or, or approved in 2015 um, and sold by New World Medical. Uh, this has a foot plate that elevates the trabecular meshwork and then brings the trabecular meshwork into two parallel blades that excise the tissue. Um, and the idea is to decrease the amount of potential scarring that might happen if you leave um, some, some of the trabecular meshwork around. Um, the, the best randomized control trial I found was um, by Falconberry in 2020, where they compared FACO KDB to FACO eye stent um, with a 12-month follow-up. Uh, the medication reduction in the FACO KDB group was greater, um, 3.2 versus 2.4 in the ice tent group. Drop reduction was the same at one, and, uh, and uh, about the same number of patients achieved an IOP of less than 18, which was their target for success in this study. Um, here you can see the 
phaco goniotomy um, versus the phaco eye stent, the, the uh, curves of the charts match pretty well um, at the, um, uh, from the one week point, and there's no significant difference at the one year point. Um, and similarly, this is kind of just showing uh, the, the proportions of patients with less than 18 millimeters of mercury here. And then in a, uh, a, uh, a 24 month prospective but non-randomized controlled trial, um, they do show um, medication or a medicated IOP reduction of 7.7 .7 at the end of the two years, as you can see here, um, as well as a drop reduction of 1.9. However, you can see that the, uh, the number of drops needed really start to creep up um, as you get past the six month point. Um, so there's, a, there's definitely a question of how, um, how long living this, uh, this effect is. And we don't really have much data beyond that. Um, just a few more uh, shorter term follow-ups. Uh, here they compare FACO, KDB again to FACO eye stent. But here um, there is a significant ethnicity difference between the two groups, 76% versus 42% African-American. Um, again, you see FACO KDB being more effective, um, but the, uh, the, the significant baseline population difference certainly brings the question how, how um, reliable that finding is. Um, in this uh, in this study by El um, Malaya and as well as um, um, it, uh, it, it also it also shows a significant ethnicity difference um, of 38% to 64% Caucasians. Um, so again, while it does show a difference between the two groups, um, it's hard to necessarily trust this information. So overall, um, I found that the uh, the evidence for goniotomy was relatively low quality, um, especially compared to the eye stent and the hydrus data. There's really minimal randomized control studies, and there's really minimal uh, studies that show um, outcomes after two years. Um, overall, from what we see, it's likely that it has a similar efficacy um, to an eye stent over the one to two year time point. Um, but it's really unclear if it's able to maintain that um, over a greater period of time. In addition, one of the potential downsides is that it is a destructive procedure um, and it can't necessarily be repeated in the same location. But here's the eye track um, provided Nova Eye Medical in 2008. Um, what this is is a catheter with a light on the end uh, that's 250 microns that's threaded through the Schlems Canal 360 degrees, um, followed by um, viscoelastic, about 100 microliters of viscoelastic that's pushed through uh, the cannula as you withdraw it. If you would like, you can also do a 360 degree goniotomy while doing that procedure. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm keeping them relatively separate. Um, so not too many good, uh, not really any uh, randomized controlled trials for the eye track, but there is a good study in 2012 by Gallardo looking at FACO eye track versus eye track alone with 24 months of follow-up. Um, they actually find that the FACO eye track decreases pressure by 6.6 .6 versus the eye track alone decreases by 7.8. Um, so a little bit more with the eye track alone versus the FACO eye track. Um, drop reduction was similar, about one drop um, in both groups. And IOP reduction was also similar, um, about 72% versus 80% hitting that 25% um, IOP decrease that they were targeting. Um, in this study by Hiami, um, again, it's a retrospective review, but up to 36 months here, um, drop reduction was the same between the FACO eye track and the eye track alone group. Um, and they also showed uh, in this study that actually baseline IOP remained stable. So they weren't really, um, targeting um, a IOP decrease because the baseline IOPs were so low, um, about 14 and 15. Um, but they do show that the mean number of medications um, over time ha has decreased. But um, as you go from about 24 months to 36 months, um, you can see that the number of medications required does start to keep up, uh, creep up in both the, the standalone group and the FACO group. I'm suggesting that maybe this effect is not as long lived. Um, here is the Omni uh, created by Site Sciences in 2018 um, as a competitor to the iTrack. Um, and it's a kind of a 
a evolution of their Visco 360 device. Um, so with the Omni, uh, it pushes a catheter through 180 degrees. Um, and then as you withdraw, it releases um, viscoelastic um, automatically. Um, it releases much less than the eye track, about 10 microliters, so about 10 times less. Um, and you can also go back in to do a 180 goniotomy um, or even a 360 goniotomy if you go into the other side. Most uh, people in these studies uh, did a 360 degree uh, canaloplasty with a 180 degrees goniotomy. Um, if a goniotomy was performed. So here, um, there are again, no um, randomized control studies uh, for the Omni or the Visco 360, um, but Vold did uh, present a paper in 2020 that was a retrospective review um, with 12 months of follow-up, looking at the outcomes of uh, 48 patients that had the Omni ABIC with goniotomy. And again, that's 180 degree anatomy for most patients. They found about a 20% decrease in IOP. And, and they also found that 73% of patients had an IOP reduction of greater than 20% while also on fewer medications, which is what they defined as a success. Um, they also found a, uh, they also separated the subgroups into group one and two, one for uh, patients above. Uh, 18 millimeters of mercury as a baseline versus patients with a below 18 millimeters of mercury. You can see the two groups here. Um, the upper group has a much more significant decrease in uh, their IOP compared to the lower group, which has been shown in numerous studies um, with glaucoma surgeries, where the higher starting IOP allows you to get a lower or a greater change in your IOP. Um, and here, this is this graph, which they, uh, um, they, they created this prediction model for uh, predicting your IOP reduction. And you can see your pre-op pressure is directly correlated with um, your likely percentage reduction. Um, and here in another study, we have uh, the FACO Omni Visco 360 canaloplasty device versus the ABIC alone. Um, and here they show a more significant uh, decrease in uh, in the patients who got the eye track, so the ABIC versus the uh, FACO Omni device. The uh, drop reduction was about the same, and they also didn't find any difference between the 360 um, versus the 180 goni goniotomy. There was a trend towards more effectiveness uh, for the 360, but um, overall is not statistically significant. Um, so overall, I would say there's um, low quality evidence for the canaloplasties. Um, there's not good long-term data. Um, they do show good IOP reduction, but it's unclear whether or not the effect uh, uh, is um, persists after two years. And just for just for time, I'll be skipping through this last uh, for ELT, which is uh, not done here, um, less common than some of the other procedures, and also does not come with really um, many retrospective clinical trials. The only one they had was ELT versus SLT with a small group. Okay, so overall take home points uh, for me is that with the eye stent and the hydrus, there's good evidence of IOP lowering effect lasting at least five years, maybe up to eight years uh, for the eye stent. Um, there's likely good IOP reduction of over 20% in about 80% of patients. And there's some moderate evidence that the hydrus might be slightly more effective than the eye stent. Um, for the goniotomy, they, um, there's not good evidence that one version of the goniotomy is better than the other, um, but there is good evidence that it's at least effective in the first one to two years. Um, and the effect size is similar to the high stent hydrus, maybe even a little bit larger. Um, however, there's not good data, like I said, to show persistence over two years. Um, one of the theoretical disadvantages is that it's a destructive process and it might prohibit you from doing something in the future, such as an ab internal canaloplasty if you remove too much of the trabecular meshwork. Um, and with the ABIX, um, again, good, good efficacy, um, but no good data over two years, but it is nice that you can repeat it. So even if um, the effect doesn't last beyond two years, it's possible to repeat it, and that is approved. Um, so you can do um, ABIC alone without doing cataract surgery. Uh, again, I skipped over the ELT today, um, but just wanted to clarify that all procedures um, had minimally significant adverse events, and they were shown to be safe.
And uh, thanks to Dr. Chai for clarifying a few terms for me. And here are my references. Thank you. Really impressive, impressive Marshall uh, and Ariana. We are at time. There was thanks, one. Marshall. Uh, we have. I, I see a few comments. So um, from Dr. Nakatsuka, I'm going to says, uh, oh, this is a steroid versus others. Um, okay. Well, at least uh, for, for Dr. Nakasuka, he's uh, mentioning that he had a young girl with trauma, retina surgery, subtenons catalog, and IOP um, in the 30s with max drops. Um, 60 after she took off the drops, the 360 trabeculectomy, um, and she dropped to the teens with no drops. Um, yeah, so he felt that could be trauma related, but with a big drop, he feels that's probably steroid response since the, the TM was removed. Um, also mentions another interesting point um, that some people are doing goniotomy at the same time as tube to blunt the steroid response, especially for valveless tubes. Very interesting. Thanks for those comments. 